So good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Neil Gordon, CEO of the Discovery Museum. And for those of who are not able to see me tonight, I would describe myself as an older white male, um, no facial hair, um, glasses that are kind of clear framed and sort of medium short and completely gray hair. Uh, used to be brown though. Um, so this is the seventh and final event of the 2021 Discovery Museum Speaker Series. These have been some great conversations with expert voices on a lot of matters of importance to our community. And as always, they've been free and open to everyone. We're really excited about tonight's uh, conversation. Uh, I hope all of you out there in the audience are uh, really as excited as I am about uh, having Mona Mankara with us. So before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we'll be reserving some time for a live question and answer at the end of the evening. And I'd like it if you could please submit your questions anytime during the talk using the Q&A button, and we'll address as many of those questions as we're able. If you have any technical questions tonight, you can use the chat button, and that'll reach the hosts for the session. Tonight's presentation will be closed captioned, and you can turn that uh, feature on and off at the bottom of your screen. Now we will be recording tonight's presentation and the recording will be available on our website in a few days and you will receive an email with a link to the presentation as well as notes and resources that are referenced here tonight. So I have a couple of things that I wanna to touch on before we introduce our guest. Um, first, um, uh, I want to thank our sponsors. And uh, it's really important to thank them because it, without them, um, we would not be able to offer the speaker series free of charge now for its ninth year. Our lead sponsor, Foundation for Metro West, was established in 1995 and is the only community foundation serving the Metro West region of Massachusetts. It promotes philanthropy across the area, helps donors maximize the impact of their local giving, and serves as a resource for nonprofit organizations like the Discovery Museum and enhances the quality of life for everyone. Our investor sponsor, Enterprise Bank, is headquartered in Lowell, Massachusetts, with 26 branch locations throughout the Merrimack Valley and North Central regions of Massachusetts and Southern New Hampshire. They are a true community bank, leading with a deep sense of mission and purpose. Their success is consistently measured by the success of the individuals, businesses, and communities they enthusiastically serve. We thank the foundation, the bank, and all of our generous sponsors for their support. So with your indulgence, I'd now like to share a little bit about the Discovery Museum. The Discovery Museum has been serving the children and families of Massachusetts for nearly 40 years. We're proud of our speaker series, these conversations that are important uh, for kids and families in these complex and challenging times. We're gonna have an exciting lineup of speakers for next year, and we'll be announcing that lineup in January. If you know our museum, you know that there are a few ideas we use as the foundation for our work. We believe in nurturing the natural creativity and curiosity of children. We understand the importance of kids learning alongside the adults in their lives. And we recognize that understanding is as important as knowledge. Through everything, science and equitable access stand at the core of our mission, helping all kids build early confidence in their own abilities to identify and solve problems and persist even the, through failure. Because it is critical that all children without regard to their gender identity, cultural background, differences in, in ability or financial means, see themselves as science learners. We at the Discovery Museum take the idea of representation very seriously. We have launched, just launched, a new exhibit called Picture Yourself, Women in Steam, in which local female artists have depicted six accomplished women in the science and arts. The accompanying panels show them as young girls and talk about their journey, 
research, and hobbies. You can meet many of the scientists and artists from the exhibit here at the museum on November 13th between 1 and 3 p.m. We're excited to continue this important work uh, so that we can inspire more girls to grow up to be the Dr. Mankaras of the future. So um, we are pleased and excited that Dr. Mona Mankara is joining us tonight. Dr. Mankara is a tenure track assistant professor of, of, of bioengineering at Northeastern University. She lost her vision at a young age, having been diagnosed with macular degeneration and cone rod dystrophy at seven years old. In spite of some people questioning her ability to accomplish her goals, Mona told herself that she could and would one day become a scientist. Her undergraduate years at Wellesley College inspired her to enter research, and she ultimately earned a PhD in chemistry from the University of Florida. Her professional work centers on the use of computer simulations to obtain a deeper understanding of, of chemical interactions in biology and how to leverage that knowledge to engineer better treatments and drug delivery delivery methodologies. Now, Mona, among many things, is also a world traveler, a Harry Potter fan. I don't know about this one, Mona, a hater of bananas and a tea drinker. Um, so we're really excited, Mona, that you were able to join us tonight. And um, just make sure you're unmuted and welcome uh, and uh, to, uh, to join us tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you very, very much, Neil, for this gracious uh, introduction. I do have to say I don't like bananas. I just have never liked the smell or the taste of them. Um, so I have, I have a blog of funny things that happened to me called Banana Days on my website. So if you ever want a good laugh, check it out. Good luck tonight, Mona. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll take it away. Good evening, everyone. Everyone who's sitting right now and listening. I suppose I'm here to share with you my story. It's really a story of an individual who just wants to do what their heart desires. Ever since I was a child, I've always been fascinated by the world around me. I've always been fascinated by how the world works. I remember as a young kid, even though I was the kid of immigrants and technically English was my second language at that time, I remember watching the magic school bus and wanting to be in Miss Frizzle's class. I remember watching Bill Nye the Science Guy and wanting to be and run a show and understand the world like he does. And then one day, I remember looking at the pile of toys in my bedroom and looking again and they were gone. And it scared me. I remember being so freaked out that at one moment I could see the toys and the next I couldn't. And that began a journey of trying to figure out what was going on. So by the time I was seven years old, we had just moved to right outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I was diagnosed with macular degeneration and cone rod dystrophy at the Children's Museum, actually, by Dr. Ann Fulton. And this is when things seemed to change. Everybody seemed to think that my path in life was no longer as bright as it used to be before the knowledge of my blindness. There was a lot of people around that thought, okay, this person is just gonna have to manage. They are lacking eyesight. What kind of future can they have? At the time, we used to go to Lebanon, and my mom actually took me to one of the eye, best eye doctors in Lebanon. And that's where I will never forget leaving the doctor's office that day, and my mom was crying. It wasn't until I was like in college, like I had made it to college, in which my mom had informed me that the doctor had said to her that it wasn't worth spending a penny on my education. And that's in a way where my journey began. My passion for science has always been innate to me. It's a part of me. And so when I was diagnosed, I didn't understand why everybody was like freaking out. 
but everybody was because they saw that my future could no longer be as bright. But how wrong was that? How wrong was that? So life continued and my passion for science didn't dissipate. If anything, I just continued ignoring all the like negative feelings around my eyesight and I just continued learning and doing, you know, watching the magic school bus and watching Bill Nye the Science Guy. I remember in fourth grade doing my report on Marie Curie and learning how much she interacted with her materials and how she was as a scientist and being, I remember being very um, inspired by her. And life moved on. And I was internally defiant to the fact that I didn't think that it was the end of the world that I couldn't see. And I went through the public school system and I didn't fully understand my potential because this is the kicker, everybody out there. No matter how hard we tell ourselves, we are impacted by what people say, right? We are. And I had started to internalize that maybe my blindness is weakness, that maybe I couldn't be the scientist that I wanted to be, that I couldn't be Marie Curie. But I still pursued what I loved because I can't do anything else. <laughs> my heart still had an opinion. And I moved forward. And I remember, I remember very vividly, I have to give credit to my parents, that they allowed me to be me. And I think that's one of the most important things in the world to have, is to have the space to be yourself. So I grew up, and I remember in high school, um, I was so bored in the lower level classes that I decided that I wanted to take advanced biology. And the teacher was like, you're going to fail. And, you know, people were really warning me. And they're like, are you sure you want to do this? And I was like, in my head, I was like, there's really nothing worse. I'm, I'm so bored. Like, what is going to happen? I fail? Okay. I told them, I have the right to fail. My parents are taxpayers. Yes, I want to take advanced biology. And this was a pivotal point in my life. Because I took that class and I got one of the best grades in that class. And the teacher actually apologized to me. And after that, I started to realize, wait, I get to decide where I want to go. I get to decide my potential. Let me try. It's okay to fail, but let me try. So I started to, and I tried everything, um, including like advanced English. And I really didn't like writing at the time. So that, you know, I realized that wasn't where my heart lied, but I tried. And because of that, I actually got into Wellesley College. And this is where the adventure began. I was out into the world and I wanted to learn everything. My curiosity was insatiable. <laughs> I started to take chemistry. I thought I wanted to be a doctor. I also thought I might wa want to do history. I changed my major like 10 times. Yeah, I know I wasn't like, I was kind of all over the place. And finally, junior year of college, <laughs> Everybody's like, you really need to declare something. And I remember looking back at my transcript and be like, oh, I think I took the most chemistry classes. So I'll do chemistry and Middle Eastern studies. And I remember taking quantum chemistry and falling in love. I was like, this is it. During this time, I had already been doing like research for the summer. I would get an NSF RU that stands for National Science Foundation Research Experience for Undergrads. And this is something really important for everyone out there. Nobody does anything in life on their own, right? We're always receivers. We're, we're also, we're always receiving someone else's help. We, every single one of us, none of us do like gets to where we need to go on their own. So when I was a first year at Wellesley College, um, you know, I was kind of lost. I didn't know, like, like, you know, I was trying to figure out my way and I was trying to figure out the accommodations that I needed. And one day this girl, Shazi Ali comes up to me and says, Mona, have you heard about this NSF RU? You really should do one over the summer. You said you love science. Like this is a great opportunity. And I was like, well, I don't know how to do it. Like, how do I do it? Like, how, how does it go about? And then she was like, oh, you just need to apply here. I was like, yeah, but this link isn't accessible. And I, I don't, I need help submitting. And she actually offered to help me. 
I'll never forget this because she stayed up all night. It was like the day, like the deadline, the day before when it was due and stayed up with me to submit my application for my first NSF, first NSF RU program. By the way, I ended up doing it every summer after that. And that's how I entered the field of research. And that's something that came along. I, I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to recognize also the moments of help. There are so many moments of people telling me I couldn't do it, but there are so many moments of people being like, hey, let me help you do what you wanna do. And I think that's really important for us to always walk and pay attention whenever we interact with others. Are we encouraging others to follow their dream, to aid them in experience, like experiencing their potential? And that's what this friend did for me. She, she supported me in following my dream. And so I started to do research. I was in a lab. I, I, was, I was introduced to computational chemistry. I was blown away by this ability to understand the world of atoms through computers and that I could do it. So then fast forward, I took quantum chemistry and I fell in love. Now, after that, I realized I wanted to be a researcher. And I actually ended up getting uh, an HHMI like research, I don't know, award that allowed me to do research for one year after I graduated undergrad. And this is why I really learned my love for research. And I was like, okay, so in order for me to continue doing research, I need to go to graduate school. So I applied to graduate school and this was a really interesting journey for me because I got into a lot of different graduate schools. I actually ended up University of Florida first and foremost, because it was the school that had the best disabilities office and they rolled out the red carpet for me. And that's also a very important thing to pay attention to. Sometimes success doesn't mean the best name school, but it means that it's gonna be the environment that gives you the best tools. So in life, one of my biggest philosophies is collect as many tools as possible and make sure that you're in an environment that can allow you to succeed. So I decided to go to University of Florida, even though it was nowhere near on my radar, it was a complete chance that I ended up going to visit and choosing it. But because of how they treated me, and I did end up having an amazing experience in the disabilities office there, I succeeded. And five years, not knowing how I was gonna do it, day by day, step by step, I actually got a PhD. And again, there's a lot of instrumental people along the way. But this is the kicker. I'm gonna tell you something really interesting. When I graduated and I was looking for jobs, Professor J. Ilya Seatman from the University of Minnesota reached out to me. He's from the Chemical Theory Center, one of the best chemistry theory centers in the country. He reaches out to me and says, Mona, if you want, you have a job in my lab. And at the time, I had still internalized that I needed to overcome my blindness. So I said to him, okay, let's meet. Let's have a conversation. And what was really funny about this conversation that instead of it being an interview where he interviewed me, I was sitting there telling him, like, Ilya, do you know that I am different? Do you know that I'm blind? Do you know that I might be slower? Do you know that I, you know, I'm unconventional and might need extra accommodations? And you know what he said to me? something that was also pivotal for me. He said, Mona, I know that you're blind. That is why I want you in my lab because I know you problem solve differently than other people. And because of that, you're gonna solve problems that nobody else solved. And it hit me. And I was like, oh my God, he sees my blindness as an advantage. And I said to myself, oh, Minnesota, here I come, even though I didn't want to go to the tundra. But I had to say yes. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made because there I was in an environment that challenged me with an advisor that understood that I brought a unique perspective. So in other, in other circumstances, I've told the story, it's like, you know, it's a long scientific story where I say that we have, as a blind scientist, I have an unseen advantage. 
And I tell the story about how I was able to figure out patterns in a protein that I was studying just because I didn't use my eyes, but I had to mathematically look model the movement and I interacted with the math first. So what does that tell me at that point? I was, I just finished my PhD. I was an adult and I was still learning that I had internalized that blindness was weakness as opposed to recognizing that maybe I shouldn't see it as a lack, that me as a full package, there's abundance. There's uniqueness in the way I problem solve. And how amazing that I was able to learn that from my advisor. Along the way, when I was a graduate student, halfway through, I actually got the opportunity to TA. And that's where I learned that I wanted to teach. It wasn't a plan that I had for, since I was a child. I didn't know. If you had asked me 10 years ago, I was going to be a professor of bioengineering, I would have been like, really? Because this is all I knew since I was a kid, that I wanted to be a scientist. I didn't know how. I didn't know how it was going to look like. But I knew that I wanted to be a scientist. So now when I was a postdoc, my advisor pushed me. He made me a better scientist. He never lowered his standards for me. He understood that I was blind and sometimes things might take me a little bit longer, but his standards were never lowered. This is key. This is very important. I had the intellect to be a scientist. Things might've just been a little bit different to how I did my science. And not only that, he understood the advantage that I brought to the table and he taught me that. And this is something that stays with me. And now after I was able to do research with him and get my position at Northeastern University in the bioengineering department, it's something that I bring to my students. It's something that I bring to my classroom. My classroom is not a conventional classroom. It's not like what you envision a science class where you go in and you sit down and you just, you know, listen to the teacher lecture, no. You come into my class, it's interactive. We're having conversations. We are going back and forth and we're working together so that I teach you the material. And I've actually published a paper about my method of teaching because it's quite unique because I can't see the board and I can't see the screen. So I'm sitting here having to teach very deeply mathematical problems and deriving equations while I can't see. But guess what? It's possible. It's done. It's possible to the point that I, in one of my teaching surveys, I will never forget this, I had a student write, I didn't realize how non-visual biomolecular dynamics and control is. <laughs> Can you imagine? My student thought that this was not a visual subject anymore. And so I leave all of you with this. What boundaries are you pushing through? When you interact with people, do you predetermine their potential? Or are you supporting people in finding their potential? When you look at yourself and you see something that you're lacking, do you really see the lack or can you see the abundance in what you might have? Because the truth of it, we all come differently. That's the truth. My eyesight, sure, I, I'm not having eyesight. But I have abundance in other ways. I'm a great problem solver and I can be a scientist. There's an advantage. So with that, I really hope all of you came along for the journey. You could imagine me along the way. And by the way, just as a side note, I am also somebody who has, you know, created the YouTube channel, Planes, Trains and Canes, where I travel to five different cities around the world and experience public transportation on my own. This was a really interesting adventure. I was able to do that thanks to the Holman Prize given out by the Lighthouse for the Blind of San Francisco. And I have now you know, been able to start a research program here at Northeastern University called the Combined Lab. It stands for Computational Modeling for Biointerface Engineering. Um, we're always looking for bright individuals to join um, from undergrad to graduate to postdoc level. And finally, I just was able, to, I, I'm always down for an adventure. 
for I think what matters to me the most. It's something, you know, I just finished reading The Alchemist. I don't know if anybody in the audience knows The Alchemist by Paolo or Corelio. I can't say his name. Um, but the story is of a boy who follows his heart's desire and recognizes that the past is sometimes circuitous. But as long as you honor that, things end up opening up for you. And that's really how I feel. I always tell people that I've always wanted to be a scientist and I am a scientist now. I would have never thought the way to do that would be to be a bioengineering professor at Northeastern University. So with that, I hope all of you uh, came along for the ride and if you have any questions, so I can open up now for the fireside chat with Neil. Thank you. No, thank you for that summary of your of your experience in your life. It's it's really fascinating, and I'm sure it's inspired. So, I'm I'm before I get to the questions that our audience has um, been sending us. And by the way, I would encourage folks out there to use the Q and A button to send us along some more questions. Mona, you, there's one one question I got to ask you right off because you yeah. sort of you finished by saying you're always up for an adventure. Um, and you know, we we saw this story in the paper about you today that from this weekend, and it seems like you did something completely, I don't know, I want to say crazy, but arguably <laughs> just unique. Um, could you could you tell everybody about that? Sure. Okay. So for everybody listening out there, so it turns out I was, I mean, this past weekend, I experienced zero gravity. And the way I did that was with an organization called Astro Access, which is their goal is to make space accessible for all. So for the first time for historical, for historic flight, 12 disabled people, individuals, four of us were blind, two deaf and six mobility impaired, were placed on a plane, flew up, playing free falls over and over 15 times, you know, going up and down. And while we're going down, we get to experience something called weightlessness or zero gravity or microgravity. And we were able to conduct experiments to see how can we make environments like the space station or space travel accessible to all? Can we help build, you know, the future? And so that's what I ended up, got, that's what I had got to do. I actually was an individual on one on that flight and I got to experience microgravity. It, it sounds like an incredible experience. What, oh, what, what, what were you feeling and um, how, how, you know, how was it? It was nothing like I've ever done before. I mean, think about it. Think about how, while we're living, you're always, touching something, right? You're always tethered. You're either standing on the ground, you're sitting on a chair, laying on a bed, like you're always touching something. You're never not touching anything, right? But there I was in zero gravity and no part of my body was touching anything. And I was just free floating in the middle of space, completely untethered. Sometimes not knowing which way it was up and down, sometimes knowing it, you know, sometimes colliding, sometimes like it was, it was just an experience like nothing before. I, I, I can't, I can't imagine that I, I, hopefully you're going to find a way to work this into your, your teaching and your, and your story going forward. I, I, I would think it would be kind of a, uh, a, a very cool experience and um, hopefully all the other folks you shared it with will We'll collaborate on telling that story as well. Oh yeah, for sure. That's good. So um, let me start out with a, um, a couple of questions that come from uh, folks in the audience. Um, um, both one one from a from a parent who has a blind child, and I'm I'm going to sort of read these questions if that's okay, so that I don't put words in anybody's mouth. And the first one is kind of long. It's a multi-part question. It goes, I have a blind child. Any advice for her? How do you think being blind challenged you socially? What percentage of your time do you spend answering ignorant questions? Uh, and what is your attitude towards it? Do you have a strategy? 
Sometimes my daughter says she's tired of being a blind girl and just wants to be a girl, since daily she would, must do so much to educate her peers. How do you keep going? That's a, that's a lot in that that's question. A really, that's a, honestly, that's a really good question. And I hope, first of all, um, for how, whomever that is, feel free to reach out to me, and especially if you want the kid to reach out to me, because sometimes it does feel kind of lonely, okay? And I think it's really important for her to have camaraderie in, in other people, other blind people. Now, what I would want to tell that kid is sometimes, you know, you don't owe anybody an explanation. And you just got to do what you got to do. And I know it feels tiresome sometimes to be blind, but it is a part of who you are. Just like whatever your height is, just like, you know, other features of you. It's a part of who you are. Now, if we can sit down and try to figure out a way for you to see it in a different light or like, you know, or even just um, recognize that maybe because of that, you're going to be a much better problem solver and that you don't really need to explain that to anybody else. I think that's really important. But at the end of the day, if you need somebody to reach out to and talk to, I'm here because it does sometimes suck <laughs> it just is but the reality is anybody else who's different that's just part of growing up and unfortunately growing up in, in an environment when you're different people tend to notice and it's not cool but you know what it's going to give you an edge when you grow up just wait there you go. i like I, I like that did you did you have somebody in particular that you were you shared camaraderie with in, in your life. How did that, how did that work for you? I feel like I took a, an approach. I mean, my sister is also blind and she's two years younger than me. So that kind of helped, right? Of course, even though me and my sister are very different people, but also when I was in school, I think there was a period of time in which I kind of was alone, but then I found the people that were, were the best people to be with. And then, you know, just give it time and be patient. And then when you grow up, everybody then wants to be your friend because you figured it out. You figured out how to like not, you know, to do your own thing. You figured out how to do your own thing. Just wait. You'll have an edge. Mona, were there, were there things in your life that, that sort of gave you that, that, that were your source of strength for the kind of perseverance that you're talking about? Um, I'm very defiant. If somebody tells me I can't do it, I want to do it more. So weirdly enough, <laughs> that was like a source. <laughs> uh, I, I loved my science. So I focused on that, right? I always was curious about science. Like it's almost like everything else was kind of noise. And I was just curious about what I wanted to do, you know? And I read the books that I wanted to read or, you know, and, and things like that. I don't have anything more. There, there really isn't one way. And it, it's, it's challenging to be different. That's the truth. So, so we have a, um, a second question from a parent. Um, how can I, as a parent, help my child succeed in a career path he, that he wants? He is a, a Black young boy with disabilities. How can I instill and nurture confidence and self-advocacy in him? First, you have to believe that he can do it. This is very crucial, right? You have to believe that he can do it and you have to show him that he's not lacking, that it will be a struggle. Look, I'm not denying that there are struggles in life. I, can't, I cannot deny this. But if he wants to do it, he will do it. And you have to believe that too. This is very important because sometimes we we look at kids I don't have a kid of myself so I can't speak as a parent right but we look at individuals and we're like oh you know they say they want to do it you know good luck okay you can but like I like you know there's a part of us that's like sure like they really can't the truth is you have to believe that they can do it and you have to show them that they can do it and recognize and tell tell them that it's going to be a struggle and it's okay to fail and you're going to fail but if you're happy if you're really happy pursuing whatever that career is, 
you'll get there. And that's really important. And there's no pressure on time and there's no pressure on how it's gonna look like. It might be an unconventional path. You just don't know. That, that, that um, um, ability to uh, let kids fail is something that we've talked about in speaker series before. And, and, and particular for people in the sciences, um, you, you recognize that you can learn as much from your failures as from your success, right? Oh yeah, totally. Look, I think one of the biggest things that helped me is that everybody thought I would fail. So failure was not a point of fear anymore for me. I'm like, so what? Okay, I'll fail. Like, that's what everybody expects anyways. And I think there's a freedom to that because the truth of it, failure is fine. It's welcomed actually. When you stop fearing failure, you become freer. So your kid, if he tries and he fails, but he tries again and you feel like there's going to be more joy in that than doing something that doesn't fulfill him. Sure. So I hope he gets to do what he wants to do. I really do. Um, so a couple of, a couple of questions about your childhood in particular. Um, was there, was there a person or, or, or a thing that inspired you? We know you were, you were driven by science, but was there, was there some particular scientist or other person in your life? I, I, I was definitely inspired by Marie Curie as a child. I mean, I, I told you I was really inspired by like, like I want to be Miss Frizzle when I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I want to have a kindergarten class and I want to like go on, you know, hypothetical adventures where we all envision us doing all those things. Like I want to be Miss Frizzle. So I definitely was inspired by that. And by Bill, Ma like, you know, I'm a PBS kid. Like, so thank you, PBS. I became a scientist. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> yeah, Marie Curie. Yeah. The that, science. You, could, you could pick worse, make worse choices, right? That's, that's a good yeah. um, so in, in, in your journey, um, you know, what would you say was the, among the toughest experiences that you had, um, particularly either culturally or socially, um, and 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 how did you rise above those? So, like, I didn't get into schools I wanted to get into. I didn't, you know, publish the research I wanted to publish, or something like that. You know, like I feel like I don't have one thing. Failures come and go. That's the truth, and there are definitely moments in which you have a specific plan in mind and um you think to yourself that is my path to being the scientist and then everything gets top topsy-turvy and you feel like you failed but then you realize later on like much later on you're like wait you know maybe it was for the best and I'm still on the path of science because at the end of the day nobody could change your heart right like your heart is your heart and you need to follow it um, so I don't have like one moment. I just, there's a lot of many failures along the way that at the time felt so big, but now they don't feel that big anymore. But then, you know, I move forward and it feels like sometimes it's the same thing now, you know, and you're like, oh, you know, my paper got rejected. And then you're like, wait, maybe there's a better journal. And then you submit there and it works or, you know, oh, my grant got rejected. Like it just, it's part of the cycle of life. But as long as I'm trying to do what I love doing, I would say overall, I'm doing okay. It's okay. It's all good. Yeah, I mean that that ability to keep going through failure, and you know, a lot of talk out there about the importance of perseverance uh, for kids, and it, it just you're just reinforcing that learning to fail at a young age is a really really important skill for kids. Right. And to honor also your heart. I think that's the biggest, you know, I think it would be the saddest thing if somebody gave up on their heart's desire or their passion. Yeah. See, that's the saddest thing, you know, because it's okay if I'm trying to be a scientist and I might not be the best scientist, but I'm trying and I fail, but I try again because at least I'm happy trying. Yeah. 
And well, you found you found what you were passionate about, and that's what you went for, and that's really that's an important. I'm just, important <laughs> I'm just really curious. Like I just I can't help it. Like I'm just really curious, and then and then I don't stop there. I always have to share it. I always say this is like a knowledge catalyst. So I talk about being curious, like engaging, discovering, and then sharing. And that's really important because you want to include more people. And when you do that, then you cycle through the same information and it's different. And then, and that's how we progress and bring in more people. But yeah. Maybe then, you could maybe you could talk about that a little bit. I read read some of that work on your website about the knowledge catalysts and and um, maybe you could talk, tell people a little bit about your, your thinking about that. So um, in essence, one of my fundamental ways of approaching life is curiosity, but it doesn't just stop there, right? Because you can be curious, but then nothing happens. So after I'm curious, I like to engage with whatever I'm curious with. I like to discover something. Um, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. But then at the end of the day, you have to share that. You have to, because when you share, you cycle through it, right? You include more people in the process. So that comes out in my life in different ways from being a professor and I'm teaching in front of the class, right? I'm sharing the material, you know, being a researcher and then publishing the information. It's not enough to just discover and keep it to yourself to being somebody who did planes, trains and canes where I brought people along to experience how it is to travel independently as a blind person using public transportation around, you know, five cities around the world. There's always an element of sharing. And when you share, that causes conversation. When conversation starts, that increases people's curiosity. And then the circle continues and it grows and it grows. And that's how the world can then, in, you know, create and discover new things. That's a, that's just a really important uh, idea. It's a simple idea, but it's a really important idea. You know, yeah. people, people lose, lose sight of the fact that they can, they can spur other people's thinking by just telling what they know and talking about it that's really yeah. a really important idea um one one sort of maybe last question about your your childhood we'll, maybe we'll come back to this um as you were a kid growing up and um trying to start your journey on becoming a scientist now when you look back do you wish there were some resources that um you might have had that that weren't available then maybe are available now 100 100 100 i don't regret anything you know like it is what it is but i wish it so strongly that now me and two of my friends we created a business it's called senses designs where we actually 3d print educational tools that are accessible to all i mean you know some of them are accessible to all some of them are more blind specific for example we have a molecular modeling kit usually molecular modeling kits are just colored and not textured, but ours are textured, which means a sighted and blind kid could be using the same modeling kit and get the same information. And that's our goal, you know, to replace the other modeling kits with this one because it's universal. We have build your own DNA. We have a braille periodic table that's printed in such a way that it's white dots on a black background. So a teacher can easily bridge the gap and see where the kid is trying to read and compare it to the regular periodic table for them. Regular meaning like print, not regular, but you know what I mean? So like we, we are working on creating these educational tools that I wish I had as a kid. And how awesome is that? And we're 3D printing it all with like plant-based plastic so that, you know, doesn't harm the environment. And it's eventually we wanna give it out and we wanna sell them and we wanna be sustainable, so. Uh, that's really fabulous uh, stuff that I love the, the to talk about um, universal or inclusive design. You know, that's such an important principle now. And it's something certainly our museum has tried to adopt in the, in the way we design exhibits. You know, a, a, an exhibit that's um, really well done or a, or a device like you're talking is, is sort of really beneficial to everyone and works for everyone. Uh, we, put, we put a link to um, in the uh, in the chat. So, oh, thank you. Census Designs is awesome, yeah. Design. We'll, um, we'll be starting to sell soon, but in, in the meantime, if you guys have any requests, please send us. There's a place to message us, and we're working on it. We're, we're almost done with our prototypes. We've tested them. We're ready to ship out soon. I saw that you had done some earlier work earlier in your career on a, 
on a, a STEM STEM curriculum for the blind. Uh, a fully, yeah, an accessible STEM curriculum for the blind where, I mean, it was for a two week camp. It was also low cost material. This was really important to me. You know, I wanted this to be something achievable by as many kids as possible. And so we did everything from uh, like endothermic, exothermic reactions in a bag so you could feel them to creating like fizzy lemonade to, you know, extracting DNA from strawberries. We did all that. Yeah. With any eyesight, every kid had to wear a blindfold. Huh. That's and did it independently. That, that was really important too. Like there's collaboration, but to do it yourself, to not have somebody do it for you, but you do it yourself, there's nothing like that. Yeah. You have to have the student try it. Did, That's empowering. Were there things that the kids said after trying that? that oh my God. There, yeah, there was um, a, a moment, I will never forget this, where two high school kids literally jumped up and down out of excitement from extracting DNA from a strawberry. Yeah. I'll never forget that. <laughs> They're like, wow, I did this mastery. Like it feels like a slimy line. Um, but yeah. And 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 were these sighted kids who did it with the blindfold on? Or um, one was and the other one wasn't. The other one was blind with a blindfold, and the sighted kid was blindfolded. Everybody was blindfolded. Yeah. Sighted and blind alike. So no eyesight, because there's a there's a spectrum of vision. You know, you can have a little bit of sight, or all your sight could be got. Like there's there's a spectrum. So we wanted everybody on the same footing. And what was fascinating, just to tell you this, we did this with ages six to twenty five, and it was really interesting. Like when you started to enter the ages of like ten and higher, our classrooms were divided half sighted, half blind. Everybody had to wear a blindfold. But what was fascinating is that a lot of times the blind kids already were like, I can't do it. But the sighted kids were like, let me try to do it, even though they're wearing a blindfold. And that inspired the blind kids to try too. But that showed me something about how much society pushes upon these blind kids that they can't do it, that they've internalized it. Wow. So it's really important when we recognize how we teach in our classroom. Let the kids do it. It's such a powerful learning experience that you just have created there. It, that's wonderful. Um, I, I, after this, I have to learn more about that. That seems like a really, you know, a, a thing that can be done in a lot of different settings. Oh yeah, I mean, maybe the Discovery Museum because it is low cost materials too. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so you, you, you know, going back to your adventure side, um, tell us a little bit about your love for travel and and where that's taken you and and what you know whether there's any connection in your mind between your love for travel and your love for science i'm just an explorer and i'm curious so curiosity makes me wonder and go and explore new places i i cannot believe i was able to win the holman prize to be able to do that and um, again, it wasn't enough for me to just do it and keep it to myself. Sorry, pick up. Okay. But I had to share the experience. And so I got to do that through playing Strains and Kings and bring yeah. everybody along. So for everybody out there, I got to go to Johannesburg, London, Istanbul, Singapore, and Tokyo. And you know what was fascinating? I reached a level of mental freedom that I didn't even know before. I remember telling myself, Mona, it's okay to get lost. And I actually made sure that I was truly okay with getting lost. If I got lost, it's like an added thing for the documentary, for the story. That's fine. But I really wanted to try to navigate. Like I remember going to Johannesburg and deciding to take on the Atlanta airport myself. Like, you know, I'm blind. I'm trying to navigate it and asking people along the way. And I did it. But I actually took the train the wrong way. And, you know, I, I, I was okay with getting lost, even if it meant I had to be rebooked on another flight. But when I got to that point, when I got to the point of being okay and allowing myself to try, when I did it, the joy that I felt was remarkable because I did it. 
I never yeah. realized all that pressure that I had before was just self-inflicted, societally inflicted, whatever it might be. Freedom is achievable. You don't have to actually travel to feel this way. You know, like you don't need to, you know, win a home and prize to do it. I mean, it'd be cool if you had an idea, but like you realize, I realize at least that like, that's just a state of mind, allowing yourself to do things differently. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of um, questions from folks about your sort of current work and, and, and what you're doing at work. And one is sort of a practical question and, and that's sort of what kind of adaptive equipment, devices, software do you use? And, and you know, what particular accommodations are important for you to be able to do your work? Okay, so that's a really good question. And I've actually outlined a lot of the tools that I use on my website, monomacara.com on a page called Blind Scientist Tools, where I outline every single piece of software, hardware, even how I work with people, because a lot of my work is actually done with a team of access assistants. So people who read to me and describe things because of the majority of the world of science is not accessible. So all of that is broken down. I have everything on there from using JAWS on a Windows machine to using you know, my Braille display, to using, um, you know, my cane to get around, to using, you know, my iPhone that talks. Like I, I have so many different techniques. I even talk about how to visualize a protein in the past. I've actually used Play-Doh and had somebody to kind of generally shape it so that I could get the general structure of the protein. Um, to 3D printing, to molecular modeling kits, all of that is outlined and laid out on that page to help with people. I mean, not all blind people are going to need the same things, but I'm hoping that this can minimize reinventing the wheel. Yeah, that's really good. That, that sounds like a great resource. And, you know, it's probably both fascinating to people who are interested, but I imagine it's a, um, a real resource for folks who are trying to follow the same path as you. Are, are, are you, do, do you find that you are a, a, a role model and resource for um, younger blind science students who are trying to follow your path? I don't know. I don't really think about it, but I would definitely love to be a resource. I mean, look, my goal, one of my main goals is to allow people to be themselves. So if there are blind individuals that want to be scientists, count me in. I want to help you succeed because the world ne needs more people who are doing what they're passionate about. And, um, if it means sharing my experience to help that, then the more I will, you know, <laughs> like, and sharing all the tools that I've gathered and documenting that, why not? The more the merrier. That, that's great. Um, so uh, we had a very specific question about what led you to study the sort of lung surfacant, surfacants? Surfactants, okay. Surfactants, sorry. Uh, well before the current pandemic. Okay, that, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, isn't it funny how it ended up being extremely relevant? So what I did is as a graduate student, I studied more proteins. And then as a postdoc, I studied surfactants. So on the graduate student years, I was more on the biochemistry side. But then when I went on to being a postdoc, I was more on the material side and studying surfactants. So then I was like, what can I do? What area can I study that kind of combines both areas of knowledge? So I searched and I searched and I was like, oh, pulmonary surfactant. It has proteins and it has surfactants and it has surfactant proteins. And that's why I decided so that I can use all the tools that I learned. That's great. Yeah. Um, good question. Really good question. And so Mona, we're, we're we're getting near the end of our time, but I wanted to ask you a question. We, you know, the museum has started um, some efforts to uh, through a program called Picture Yourself to do more representation in our museum of of uh, women in the sciences, um, and as a way of, of helping inspire girls. And you know, I, I it it strikes me that you know you had. 
um, you were you were both a, a, a blind person and a blind girl uh, trying to get into the sciences. And which were, were was that sort of a, a double barrier or a double asset? Uh, I mean, that's a good question, right? It's both, right? It's a double barrier because of societal constraints. It's a double asset because of what I could actually contribute to the world of science. See, that's the thing. A lot of the times, barriers are placed by others. As a good friend of mine says, it's not us who are disabled, but the environments are disabling, right? And so this is really important and crucial to pay attention to. Um, we're the ones as human beings who make it harder for each other. It, the world isn't designed for a blind person, but we can make it that way. It just isn't right now. So it's both a double barrier and a double asset, you know? The barrier comes from society. The asset is what the person can actually contribute. I, I imagine a lot of the good, the advice you gave us tonight about overcoming the barriers of blind, you would probably give to a, a young sighted girl say and the same kind of encouragement about yeah anybody who's who's different anybody who sticks out anybody who's getting societal barriers because honestly we are the ones who kind of block other people the most so it's really important that we pay attention to what we do and how we interact with others yeah well i, I you know mona i really appreciate you you taking the time tonight to, to talk to us about this and i think you helped um, us all think a lot about what sort of creating a more inclusive space and opportunities is all about. And you've also given us a, 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 a real insight into sort of the importance of, you know, personal motivation and, and perseverance and, and how important it is to encourage that in, in all of our kids um, and, and the importance of, of um, um, role models like yourself um, to, to help inspire the, the next generation. So uh, I, we really appreciate all of all the things you're doing and especially you taking the time to share your to share, which is we know really important, your story with us um, tonight. Um, Thank you. That's great. And, and with that folks, I, I would uh, encourage you to pay attention for our uh, upcoming um, announcement of next year's speaker series. And if anybody is able to join us um, for the Picture Yourself opening on November 13th, um, please please try to do that. So with that, I'll, I'll say good night to everyone. And I just wanna say one more thing. If you wanna reach out to me, you can check me out at monamincara.com. That's M-O-N-A-M-I-N-K-A-R-A.com. There's a contact me page there and the link so you can definitely just send me an email. Super, thank you for, for making that offer. Good night, everyone. Good night.